Welcome to podcast two of Civility Speaks with me, Robert Sachs. When I began to write this book, The Path of Civility, I looked at two different aspects of my, my own life in terms of what, what I've been doing. Uh, one was uh, myself being a practitioner of um, Buddhist tradition since my mid-20s. And then more recently, my involvement with Freemasonry, where actually one of the reasons why I really became more interested in Freemasonry had to do with the uh, 2000 election, seeing what was going on politically, and wanting to understand a little bit about what this country is about from the very, very beginning. And so I ended up reading some books about the life of George Washington and other founding members of the American experiment. So these two aspects are there in my life. And there's a great Buddhist teacher by the name of Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche who said once, do what's in front of your face. So as this is what my life has been about, this is what was in front of my face, this is what I decided to look at. At the same time though, um, these things seem kind of um, disparate or don't necessarily make sense to a lot of people. Um, they look at the idea of a book on the path of civility, my book, uh, or probably any book on civility, that mentions the Buddha and George Washington as being a bit of a mashup. Like, what does this holy person have to do with this political figure? And for one thing, what I want to say is this, is that um, it's very easy to find oneself transcendentalizing uh, a figure, whether it is a, uh, a political figure or a religious figure or a spiritual figure. I think airbrushing has gone on forever. Um, in, uh, for example, in the Buddhist tradition, you have what's called namtar, that's a Tibetan word, and it means sacred bi biography. And basically what it means is you essentially look at all of those aspects of this being's life that would sort of like uh, create an icon. Uh, and you transcendentalize them. And you get rid of all the historical data about them that might get in the way of that kind of transcendentalizing experience that you want people to have when you want them to follow a political leader, follow a religious leader, or whatever. Um, I'd say it's a big problem that we face is that oftentimes we don't look at people uh, um, in their entirety, and as a result, we develop unrealistic expectations of people rather than seeing them as humans, just trying to work it out. So anyway, uh, one of the things I would like to do in order to dispel some of that disparity that people have when they look at the Buddha and George Washington is talk about them in terms of their backgrounds. So for one thing, in terms of heritages, the Buddha, who is, when he was born, was named Siddhartha Gautama, and George Washington had very, very similar backgrounds in that Washington was of landed gentry, a family that had a lot of land in the 1700s in colonial America. And he was raised in an environment where most of the daily tasks of life, other than a lot of the farm work that he ended up doing, but there were many tasks on the farm that were taken care of by servants or slaves. And then you have the life of Siddhartha Gautama, who would eventually become the Buddha, who was born into an aristocratic family and basically destined to become a king. So he had this aristocratic birth, and at the same time, many of the daily activities of his life and what was around him were taken care of by servants. In terms of education, there is a bit of a difference. In the case of George Washington, he only received eight years of formal education. And as I mentioned in the first podcast, where Washington made up for it 
was this very, very detailed study and concentration on the rules of civility, which allowed him to present himself in such a dignified way. In terms of the Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, he was given the finest education in the land at that time. Very, very, very well educated. So there is a difference in that regard. But I would say probably as he learned the aristocratic ways and the decorum of being in court, this is something Washington trained himself to exemplify in his behavior. Both of them had to deal with learning about the fragileness of life in their 20s. In the case of George Washington, he was raised on a farm, and therefore, uh, and my wife and I have come to see this in terms of having our little urban farm that you're dealing with varmints and you're dealing with weeds and you're dealing with, with various things which challenge life and support life. You see life and death. You see the transitions between the two. We're watching our chicks grow to chickens and what they cope with and how they deal with things. And so there's that kind of thing or reality that people living in the world see more frequently. On top of that, Washington then went into the army and very, very early on was involved with seeing armed conflict. So he became much more aware of the horrors of war. Now, in the case of Siddhartha, Gautama, he was basically given an airbrushed life. If there was a sick person around, the parents would take the person away. If there was an old person, they wanted the Buddha be, to be around young, beautiful people all the time. And he certainly never saw anything like death. He was given a life which was actually quite um, distorted in many respects. And then, though, you look at your own body and you see that you started off as a little boy and you moved on into teens and you're now an early adult. You are given a bride and a wife who then has a child. So you see babies. You know that babies exist. But what else is there? And so... What the Buddha did, or what Siddhartha did, before it was Buddha again, like I keep on forgetting to mention, Siddhartha decided to sneak out of the palace and check out and see what was going on in the kingdom that he would eventually inherit. And in his excursions out into the city, city environments around him, one of the first things he saw was a sick person. And like I said, Siddhartha had never seen a sick person before. Coughing or whatever. I think it was basically a leper, seeing someone who was a leper. On the next excursion out, he came out and saw old people. He had never really seen anyone that was old. Everybody was young and beautiful. Forever 21 was the Buddha's reality. That's what he was dealing with. And then finally, one time on an excursion out of the palace, he saw a corpse and realized how fragile life was. So in this way, his airbrushed reality got changed in a very, very rapid time period. Washington had more time possibly to adjust to it but both of them had these kinds of realities that they had to confront as young men and come to terms with that fragileness of life. After the Revolutionary War, there were many, many people who wished Washington would be crowned king of America. Washington refused this title, did not want to see another aristocracy, another empire created like the ones the Americans had just cast out of their land. From the standpoint 
of Siddhartha Gautama, he finishes his retreat and he is victorious in attaining his enlightenment. He has his own inner revolution. And he returns to the palace, to his family, not as someone wanting to say, okay, now it's time for me to become king. He had become a spiritual adept. He becomes someone who was quite spiritually mature. And so he chose to lead a life that was devoted to helping other people to wake up. So both of these men gave up kingdoms. Washington gave up becoming the king of America, and Siddhartha gave up becoming the king in Nepal. That was his choice. So both had the opportunity to become kings, and both of them in this world chose not to. The last comparison I want to make is a little bit more subtle, but has a lot to do with Washington as a Freemason, because some of you may or may not know that Washington was a Freemason, became a Freemason in his early 20s. And there's a deeper teaching in Freemasonry that speaks that one of the most important aspects of a Freemason's life in the public sphere is to deal with three things. First is ignorance. In Freemasonry, they talk about what do you seek, and you seek light, looking for light. So ignorance, being transformed. The other thing is to deal with fanaticism. And lastly, tyranny. It was probably because of this particular philosophy that it made it possible for there to be revolutionary lodges in colonial America that could go with the idea of casting off the British crown from control in the colonies. Again, ignorance, fanaticism, and tyranny. Interestingly enough, in terms of what the Buddha taught. And this is what all Buddhas teach. And some of you may or may not know this, but Siddhartha Gautama, now the Buddha Sakyamuni, was the fourth historical Buddha, which I could spend a couple hours explaining, but I choose not to. Let's just say that all Buddhas and this Buddha Sakyamuni are committed to the transformation of what is described in the Buddhist mind science as the three poisons. They are ignorance, attachment, and aggression. Ignorance is ignorance, we understand that. Attachment is definitely like fanaticism, where you hold on to something and say, this is the only thing that's true. We get attached to our views. And then finally, as a tyrant, we are aggressive. So in this way, we see that this life of the Buddha, of Siddhartha Gautama becoming the Buddha, is a transition from a life not that dissimilar to the life of George Washington, who works at the transformation of ignorance, overcoming fanaticism, and dealing with tyranny. So in that way, we can look at the idea of these two men are well suited to be together in a book on civility. Now, what I want to do as the sort of like um, portion on civility is to look at part of the Buddhist teachings from the Pali Canon. There was a wonderful book that was written by a Bhikkhu Bodhi. Bhikkhu means monk. And his name was Bodhi. And this book was called the Buddha's teachings on social and communal harmony. Now, some of you might go, well, I mean, doesn't the transcendent Buddha talk about like divine virtues, et cetera, et cetera, like we're used to looking at in terms of religion in the West? Well, the fact is, though, that you need to understand that Buddhism is a mind science, 
And therefore, a lot of what a mind science looks at is how the mind works in both sort of like spiritual and esoteric realms, but also on an everyday level. And again, if you remember it from my first podcast, one of the things I mentioned was that although there were hermitages and places of retreat that people went to in terms of Buddhist practice, especially early on in terms of when Sakyamuni was teaching, many of his centers and places to study were set on the outskirts of cities, which was a real challenge for a lot of people because the idea was that the Buddha saw everybody, quote unquote, on the level, that everybody had Buddha potential, which is no different from what you see in Freemasonry in terms of everybody being on the level. There's no difference. But what I want to do right now is I want to look at a particular part of the Pali Canon that Bhikkhu Bodhi writes down that has to do with social and communal harmony. And this has to do with well-spoken speech. Some of you who are familiar with Washington's rules of civility will see a lot of parallels. And that's what I want to share here, is how amazingly similar the Buddhist thinking was in relation to the thought processes that Washington came to understand and apply in his life. Those who speak with quarrelsome intent, and again, this is part of the Pali Canon, those who speak with quarrelsome intent, settled in their opinions, swollen with pride, ignoble, having assailed virtues, looking for openings to attack one another. They mutually delight when their opponent speaks badly and makes a mistake. They rejoice in his bewilderment and defeat. But noble ones don't engage in such talk. Now, noble ones are basically what I would say, people that have perfected the path of civility. If a wise person wants to talk, having known the time is right, without quarrelsomeness or pride, the sagely person should utter the speech that the noble ones practice, which is connected with the Dharma and meaning. Dharma is basically the teaching of the Buddha, which translated means the way things are. Understanding the nuts and bolts of reality. Not being insolent or aggressive, with a mind not elated, on the basis of right knowledge, he should approve of what is well expressed and should not attack what is badly stated. He should not train in fault-finding, nor seize on the other's mistakes. He should not overwhelm and crush his opponent, nor speak mendacious words. Truly, a discussion among the good is for the sake of knowledge and confidence. Such is the way the noble discusses things. This is the discussion of the noble ones. Having understood this, the wise person should not dwell up. Excuse me. The wise person should not swell up, but should discuss things. So here we have the idea that regardless of what person's station is, if you're really wanting to problem solve, trying to speak down to people never works, trying to criticize them as the first ploy to address them is going to create an imbalance, which is very, very difficult to overcome if you're really wanting to have equitable civil dialogue. Now, what's fascinating about this is that one of the reasons why there's going to be, in 2021, a conference 
on the urgency of civility is that we see how much some of, in the first two paragraphs, in terms of picking on people and finding faults in what they do, and going back to what they said maybe 20 or 30 years ago, rather than appreciating that people grow and mature and they develop better understandings. But what we do is we go back in these ways and we end up having ways in which we communicate with each other which is painful and which doesn't bring any solution. So here we have the historical Buddha, Sakyamuni, just laying it out. How do you talk with people in a way that's going to create the best way to solve problems, deal with the issues of the day? This is very, very practical. This isn't it is transcendent, but it's not transcendent. It is extraordinary, and it is very ordinary. For in its extraordinariness, what we see actually is, what we realize is that in order to create ordinary solutions, we need to rise to a level of understanding within ourselves that basic goodness, that loving nature that makes it possible for us to have civil dialogue and good solutions for the present as well as the future. So that's all I have to say for today. I hope this was useful, and I'll see you again in another podcast on Civility Speaks. Thank you very much.